when the third fire alarm rings out at a reactor testing station on a freezing January night, firefighters race to respond. Expectations of another false alarm are soon dashed. Instead, a nuclear disaster unfolds in front of them. Inside Fire Station No. 1 at the Army's National Reactor Testing Station in Idaho, the siren sounds at 9.01 p.m. A false alarm has been raised twice before in the furnace room of the support building, which houses the stationary low-power nuclear reactor. Each alarm calls for attention in a place like this, where nuclear research is conducted. The sound sends the six firefighters to put their jackets on, board the truck, and head toward the site. It's January 3, 1961, and the night is freezing. On arrival, the first place they check is the furnace room. To their surprise, the alarm in the room is silent. It is coming from somewhere else. They better check the main building where the reactor crew is housed. Over there, the firefighters find a warm but empty room. All the lights are on, and three mugs of freshly brewed coffee are still steaming on the table. There's no one in the reactor control room either, only a threatening red indicator blinking on the panel, a high radiation alert. All of a sudden, the firefighters realize what is going on. The alarm is coming from the central building where the nuclear reactor is. Definitely not a false alarm. The firefighters quickly come to their senses and rush out of the building. They run toward the truck to get their air masks and tanks. With these on, they head back into the main building and climb the stairs toward the area where the nuclear reactor is, a tall three-stage cylindrical building. At the bottom level is the reactor, above it is the operating platform with the control equipment, and on top is the ventilation fan. The three-man reactor crew is operating on the platform, where the firefighters are hoping to find them. From the outside, there's no trace of an accident. However, the portable radiation detector goes wild as the firefighters climb the stairs. The needle shows a maximum of 200 Röntgens per hour as the beeping sound turns into a steady buzzing. Believing that the detector might be wrong, Assistant Chief Ken Dearden sends one of the firefighters to bring another detector from the truck. Unfortunately, there's nothing wrong with it. The other one also shows the highest radiation level. On the operating platform level, the firefighters peer through a window in the door to figure out what is happening. The air inside is clear, and the reactor seems to be in its place. But next to it lies the bodies of two crewmen, Army Specialist Richard Leroy McKinley and John A. Burns, soaking wet and covered with blood. Around them are scattered rocks and metal debris. The situation calls for an all-out alarm. Within only 17 minutes, a health physicist accompanied by Assistant Chief Moshberger entered the facility with a higher-scale ion chamber detector. As they approached the operating platform, the detector showed a radiation level of 500 Röntgens per hour, above the lethal dose for prolonged exposure. At 10.30 p.m., Chief Health Physicist Ed Valerio and the Reactor Operations Supervisor Paul Duckworth arrived from nearby Idaho Falls. Joined by the three other health physicists, they put on Scott air packs and rushed inside the reactor building. Inside, one of the crew members, Richard Leroy McKinley, was moaning and still showing signs of life, even though he was covered in blood and in pretty bad shape. Valario and Duckworth decided to remove him from the building as quickly as possible to get him medical care. With the emergency exit blocked, the two carried McKinley all the way up through the main building. Unfortunately, during the extraction, Valario and Duckworth's air mask stopped working, forcing Valario to take off his mask and breathe contaminated air. The entire rescue operation lasted just three minutes. Sadly, McKinley never managed to reach the hospital. He died of his wounds in the ambulance. His other colleague, John A. Burns, died on the platform. Mystery surrounded the third crewman, Navy CB Construction Electrician First Class Richard C. Legg. No one could find him, dead or alive. Was his disappearance related to what happened at the reactor? The firefighters and health physicists on the scene quickly established that an exploded reactor had caused the death of the crewman. Meanwhile, 
they learned that the explosion had nothing to do with the fact that Richard Legg was missing. In fact, he wasn't missing at all. Legg had also died in the accident, but no one could find his body since a piece of the reactor impaled him to the ceiling of the building. His body hung from above unnoticed. However, what puzzled the experts was what caused such a powerful explosion. Contrary to popular belief, nuclear reactors are not dangerous contraptions. They can't explode on their own. There is a strict procedure prescribed for their operation, and an accident can only happen if one doesn't follow it. So, what went wrong with the reactor at the Idaho National Reactor Testing Station? The nuclear reactor in question was experimental, known as Stationary Low Power Reactor No. 1, or simply SL-1. It was designed as a mid-scale reactor with an output of 3 megawatts of thermal energy. SL-1 was part of the United States Army program to equip the radar stations in remote regions of the Arctic to supply them with electricity and space heating. The contract to design, build, and test the reactor prototype was given to the Argonne National Laboratory, which specialized in non-weapon-related nuclear physics. The prototype was constructed at the National Reactor Testing Station in Idaho and became operational on October 24, 1958. It used 93.20% highly enriched uranium fuel for its 3 megawatt boiling water reactor. It operated with natural circulation, using light water as a coolant and a moderator. Following extensive testing, the plant was turned over to the Army to train its personnel. The reactor and most operating equipment were housed in a large, cylindrical silo-like building made of quarter-inch steel plates. Unlike reactors positioned near urban areas, SL-1 had no pressure-type containment shell. Nevertheless, the building was able to contain most of the radioactive particles released by the eventual explosion. SL-1 was designed to function and last for decades, even in harsh conditions like the Arctic Circle. Still, it exploded and took the lives of three young servicemen. The cause for the disaster lay inside the reactor. Each nuclear reactor consists of fuel and control rods inside a sealed steel vessel filled with water. It uses a chain reaction of nuclear fissions to produce heat. Once the reaction becomes self-sustaining, the reactor reaches the so-called critical state. In the process, controlling the nuclear chain reaction is vital. That's what the control rods are used for. They limit the nuclear fission inside the reactor. If the control rods are fully inserted in the reactor, they stop fission. However, if they are entirely extracted, the nuclear chain reaction will go out of control and cause a reactor meltdown. The SL-1 nuclear reactor had a capacity of 59 fuel assemblies and 9 control rods. However, it operated with only 40 fuel elements and one control rod. Experts estimated that such an arrangement would produce more energy in the central area of the reactor. SL-1's fuel element rods consisted of 52 mils of uranium-aluminum alloy meat covered by aluminum cladding. In total, the reactor contained 31 pounds of uranium-235, a uranium isotope used to build the Little Boy atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima in 1945. The cruciform control rod was made of 60 mils thick cadmium clad with aluminum. Being the only active control rod in the reactor, it was essential for the reactor operation. That turned out to be the core of the problem and the leading cause of the accident. Since all three crewmen involved in the accident were dead, it was difficult to reconstruct the events that took place in the reactor building that day. The initial investigation determined that the reactor vessel was detached but still in its bed. However, four shield plugs designed to hold control rods were ejected and the inspection of the control rod showed it was extracted from its bed. That gave the investigators an idea of what caused the accident. It was the result of one wrong move. On the night, three crewmen underwent a routine maintenance procedure of reconnecting the control rod. Due to the Christmas holidays, the reactor was shut down for 11 days and the operators were going to put it back into operation. The procedure required the control rod to be manually withdrawn from the reactor, connected to its drive mechanism, and lowered back into the reactor. 
It was a step-by-step -step process in which the crew members strictly followed the operating manual instructions. First, one of the crew members, probably John Burns, extracted the control rod three inches from the reactor. Next, the other crewman, presumably Richard Legg, put the C-clamp on the rod to hold it in place while the drive mechanism was attached. After completing the reconnection, Burns was supposed to manually lift the rod for another two inches for Legg to take off the C-clamp and lower it into the reactor. However, instead of lifting the rod two inches, Burns lifted it 20 inches, a seemingly minor detail, but in the case of a nuclear reactor, it was the one that caused a terrible accident. As is familiar, the control rod's role in the reactor is to limit the number of nuclear fissions in order to not cause an uncontrolled chain reaction. Unfortunately, it was precisely what happened with the control rod being extracted too far. The nuclear reaction could not be contained, creating way more fissions than the reactor could withstand. This is what nuclear scientists call prompt criticality. In just 4 milliseconds, the reactor designed to produce 3 megawatts of energy produced a power output of 20 megawatts. The power excursion was so big that the fuel assemblies melted down. The fuel vaporized and produced extreme pressure inside the reactor vessel, pushing the water upward. The water hit the vessel's roof with a pressure of 10,000 pounds per square inch, sending the entire vessel up 9 feet in one-third of a second. The water broke through the shield plugs, launching them into the air at 57 miles per hour and pinning leg to the ceiling. Contaminated water and steam broke out of the vessel and sprayed the whole operating platform, killing burns and leg. McKinley, who was standing aside, was severely wounded. He died on his way to the hospital. The theory was backed up by traces of neutron-activated elements on the crewman's clothes and belongings. Also, an experiment with dummy control rods proved feasible for one man to extract the control rod 20 inches in a single pull. But the crewmen were familiar with the reactor and the dangers of extracting the control rod too far. So why would they do it? The answer lies in a misfunction of the control rod. Official reports mention that the center control rod performed more reliably than the other rods. However, there is no mention that it still got stuck seven times in the month leading up to the accident. What's more, the frequency of control rod problems increased over time. But the operating contractor, Combustion Engineering Incorporated, did nothing about it. The SL-1 project manager, W.B. Alred, later defended himself during the congressional hearings about the accident, saying that he was unaware of the sharp increase in rod jamming. According to him, if he knew, he would have shut the plant down for more detailed examination. And so, the reason for the disaster on January 3, 1961 became clear. When Burns tried to lift the control rod two inches, it got stuck. In order to release the jammed rod, he used excessive force and accidentally lifted it by 20 inches. The government downplayed the facts to avoid undermining public trust in the nuclear industry. The accident was portrayed only as a minor one that had no serious repercussions. The Atomic Energy Commission reported that no fission products were detected within the SL-1 perimeter fence other than 0.1 curies of strontium-90 and 0.5 cesium-137. In their report, the AEC not only left out many other radionuclides that were emitted, but also underestimated the amount of fission produced that night. Even with the low-balled Curie releases, the SL-1 accident was serious. When the vessel was examined afterwards, roughly 30% of the core's fuel inventory had evaporated. The SL-1 nuclear reactor accident resulted in three lives lost, a destroyed nuclear reactor facility, and an abandoned development program of the SL-1 reactor. In February 1963, the Army replaced it with the mobile low-power reactor, ML-1. It was a valuable lesson, though. As a result, all the future reactors were designed by applying a one-stuck-rod criterion to ensure that a single control rod removal would not result in excessive reactivity. As for the SL-1 nuclear reactor, it was completely dismantled. 
teams of workers removed the bulk of the contaminated debris using powerful vacuum cleaners and overhead cranes. 26,000 pounds of radioactive debris, including the reactor vessel, were buried in the proximity of the reactor's site. The depth of the three pits dug for the purpose ranged from 8 to 14 feet. The excavations were covered with at least two feet of clean backfill. In September 1962, shallow mounds of soil were added over the pits. In 2000, a riprap layer was added. In front of this awkward burial ground, fenced with wire, lies an even more awkward tombstone warning unsuspecting passers-by of the radioactive danger still lurking from below the ground. Watch this episode next if you found this video interesting. Please add a like and leave a comment if you want to support the channel.